Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. The outcries over the oppression of minorities and police brutality are believed to be why a statue of Christopher Columbus could be moved from a city park just west of downtown. A District 1 City Council member Roberto Trevino wants it on next week's agenda for a vote, saying it could be moved fairly soon if City Council approves. Jesse DeGoyato says if so, it could resolve a long running issue for the indigenous people of San Antonio. The bronze statue of Christopher Columbus, said to weigh five or six hundred pounds, may not be here much longer. I actually didn't think I would see what's going to happen in my lifetime. After more than 20 years, Antonio Diaz's appeals to remove the statue have finally been heard. It's a great story of, of all sides coming together for a, a very a very good cause, and mostly it's about healing. I think all sides want that. Yet longtime neighbor Leticia Tate says the statue should stay where it's always been. Because he didn't do anything wrong. He's Columbus. Christopher Columbus brought the institution of slavery, which was enslaving the native people. We as a city need to need to pay attention to what our community has been saying for a long time. Even the Christopher Columbus Italian Society, known for its spaghetti supper fundraisers benefiting the families of fallen first responders, the organization that donated the statue in the 1950s is on board. We're glad for whatever purpose or reason they're doing it for. Be it, he says, out of respect given the national climate or to protect it from vandalism. If city council votes to have the statue moved, the location is undisclosed. What we can say is it's it's leaving public land and and that's the end of it. Jesse De Goyado, KSAT 12 News. We're told there are now security concerns over a self-appointed armed guardians of the statue that are trying to intervene. Councilman Trevino says if needed, SAPD will respond. The Christopher Columbus Italian Society wrote, quote, although the Christopher Columbus statue in the park does not have the same associated feelings for us as it does for others, we want to be respectful and considerate of what it symbolizes and how it impacts them, end quote. We have that full statement on our website, ksat.com, along with other proposed plans for the park to honor the area's Italian heritage and its history. Another big story we're following tonight, a big win for the so-called dreamers after the United States Supreme Court blocked President Donald Trump's plan to end the DACA program. In a five to four vote, the high court ruled that the deferred adjudication for childhood arrivals program should continue. That keeps more than 500,000 children of undocumented immigrants who grew up in the United States in this country. The DACA program put in place by former President Barack Obama to protect young people from being deported from the only home they've ever known. One dreamer we spoke to says today's ruling should give people like her hope. I would hope that from the way that the Supreme Court decision came out, that people are able to think about maintaining involved in the political process and hopefully thinking of other ways on how they can be involved. But definitely, I would say that this Supreme Court decision brought a lot of hope forward. A hope, but the fight is likely not over. The court did leave a way for the president to try again, and he says he will. The man San Antonio police say began shooting in a bar parking lot on the city's north side Friday night, sending eight, pe eight people to a hospital is now in jail, but in South Florida. 37-year-old Janelius Crew was arrested this morning, leaving a hotel in Miami. U.S. Marshals say they tracked Crew to that hotel nearly a week after he's accused of shooting in the parking lot of Rebar near 410 and Broadway after staff there refused to serve the group that he was with because they say they were too drunk. Five women and three men were hurt, all expected to recover, though. Crew has had numerous run-ins with the law, including a previous charge of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. He's now facing eight counts of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon for this shooting here in San Antonio. You do it six a new brothels man facing arson charges after police say he set fires in trash cans outside the new brothels public library. 19 year old on hell Harley Rodriguez Fuentes was arrested at his home yesterday evening. It's about 12 hours earlier when firefighters were called to the library on East Common where they found three trash cans burning two near the curb one under the building's front awning. Fire crews were able to put the fires out pretty quickly. Investigators say evidence at the scene led them to Rodriguez Fuentes. He's being held on a $10,000 bond. 
Budget realities are apparently making city council members reconsider funding for the arts. City staff presented council members today with a trial budget for next year. The COVID-19 pandemic is wreaking havoc on the city's revenue sources, some of which are directly tied to city programs. Arts and culture funding, for example, comes from the hotel occupancy tax, which the city expects won't return to pre-pandemic levels for several more years without other funding that will directly affect the city's art agencies. If our economic activity drives what goes into that, then it's not really us, our priority uh, that we're setting when we set that budget. We're letting the economy determine how much should go into arts uh, and historic preservation. It's not like we're making a conscientious decision about how much money should go into that. Art and music programs have already felt the pinch. Because of projected shortfalls, the city cut off almost a million dollars worth of payments to 37 programs this year. Though they are part of the criminal justice system, juvenile courts operate under a unique set of laws. Predictably, the problems created in those courts by COVID-19, too, are unique. Paul Venema with a look at those problems, how they're being handled, and one judge's innovative approach to it all. This empty courtroom, like those in the courthouse complex downtown, is the result of COVID-19. Oh man, it's had a huge impact on our system. With few exceptions, everything is done remote. That means the process runs slower. It has a huge impact because a lot of our kids aren't gonna understand or they're not, they're not, they're not gonna be able to process you know, why it's taking so long. Limited in-person hearings are now allowed as Quesada and his juvenile court colleagues begin to deal with a backlog created during the court system's three-month shutdown. There's gonna be a huge backlog and then even, even now that we're talking about opening up the courts, you have to understand that we're only opening up to, you know, maybe five, six cases a day. So no video games, but you're playing with your iPhone. Quesada's interaction with the juveniles, he calls them his kids, isn't limited to the courtroom. He set up this drive-by in the parking lot. Okay, got it. Congratulations. You've been doing good. Allowing I'm juveniles assigned to one of three specialty courts to report in. You're doing a great job, guys. Keep going. You just try to talk to them and just, you know, you, you give your two-bit sense, you know, whatever. You learn growing up and hopefully it's six, so just a little bit, so hopefully you make a little impact on their lives. Best thing you need is a baby right now. You understand that? Sort of like a father figure, he says. Oh, I miss him. I miss all of them. Paul Venema, Case at 12 News. You do at six by this time next week. We will likely be enjoying beautiful sunsets due to the annual arrival of Saharan dust from Africa. But this year there is new cause for concern because of COVID-19 and the impact it's already having on those who are having breathing issues. Ursula Perry explains why allergists are putting out a word of warning. Breathing easy. These days, we don't take it for granted. The coronavirus's brutal attack on the lungs is well documented. Allergy specialist Dr. Erica Gonzalez Reyes says the introduction of Saharan dust now to this mix is problematic. People who are already predisposed to having respiratory problems, those that have asthma, those that have COPD, it's going to likely trigger the symptoms so uh, as it normally would. But now that we have COVID, I think people are going to be confused and anxious. The question is, is it COVID or just a reaction to the dust? Her advice, first check for a fever. So if you have a fever, that's not being induced by any type of allergic response. So um, if you have fevers, muscle aches, chills, those are clues as to something else is going on. And if your symptoms improve with the use of your asthma inhaler, it's a clue. It's allergies, not COVID-19. Still, she says it's time to be doubly careful. Now is not a time to, especially with the spikes that we've been seeing over the past week, not the time to venture out. Um, so now you're going to have multiple things going on um, that could be adding to your risk. Dr. Gonzalez says probably the best thing you can do right now if you have asthma or COPD is to be sure to take your medicine regularly. Doing so will help you to be more resilient. So when you do get triggered by stuff like this dust, you're stronger. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. We got a while before the dust, as I understand it. Right now, 
it's just that mugginess that we're feeling at it, it seemed like you could feel it more today than maybe days past yeah, it kind of depends on the time of day too when you're yeah. outdoors that that makes a difference yeah we talked about the dust a lot the past couple of days and it looks like we could get our first little bit of that african dust or saharan air layer by about tuesday wednesday of next week all right, so that's something to keep in the back of your mind if you're sensitive to that. Aquifer down seven tenths of a foot, and now we are below the June average by about half a foot. Three allergens, mold, pigweed, and grass all on the low end. 94 in Holotus. We're 92 in New Braunfels. 90 in Comfort. 87 in Canyon Lake. 92 in Floresville. Other than a few isolated showers out there this evening, uneventful, just muggy, southeasterly breeze at 5 to 15. We'll be in the 70s later tonight and early tomorrow morning. The newest drought monitor is in. We're going to talk about that and rain chances coming up. We have some late breaking news I want to bring you right now. San Antonio po Assistant Police Chief Anthony Trevino is stepping down from the force. Multiple sources confirm Trevino will retire from the department effective end of business tomorrow. Trevino served as interim chief of the San Antonio Police Department from late 2014 to October of 2015. When current Chief William McManus came out of retirement and rejoined the department, Trevino went back to being an assistant chief. Trevino has worked for SAPD since 1993. Meantime, let's turn now to the latest on COVID-19 here in San Antonio. We are just moments away from the daily briefing with city and county leaders on the latest number of cases. Let's listen in. South Texas Regional Advisory Council coordinating with all of our regional hospitals. This is our update for the COVID-19 for the San Antonio community. Tonight, we're continuing to see a disturbing trend of more cases, uh, both uh, total infections as well as in our hospitals. There are a total of 408 new cases of COVID-19 in our community from yesterday, which brings us to a total of 5,550. We do have, sadly, two new COVID-related deaths to report tonight, bringing our total to 92. One individual is a Hispanic male in his 80s, and the other was a Hispanic male in his 70s. Our condolences are with their loved ones. Uh, over in our hospitals, um, you know, again, we are looking at total increases in cases, but we're also seeing an increase in hospitalizations, which is not good. So we want to emphasize all of the measures that we've been saying from the very beginning. But in, in terms of numbers, we have 267 patients in the hospital tonight. That's up 26 from yesterday. Uh, 92 are in intensive care and 40 are on ventilators. These are trends that we should be uh, concerned about. And so we are acting accordingly and we want you to as well. For the past several days, we've seen staggering increases in both positive cases and hospitalizations. But I do want to emphasize that our hospital system, uh, we are monitoring the capacity and it remains stable. And these trends, though, uh, are going in the wrong direction, which is why we are calling on you to act uh, and make sure that you're practicing physical distancing, wearing masks, not letting your guard down, wash your hands with soap and water. And of course, uh, the tried and true, keep six feet of difference distance between uh, you and those who are outside of your household. I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf. Thank you. And as you know, Mayor Nuremberg and I both issued a emergency orders requiring uh, those that are di dealing direct goods and services to the public uh, must develop and implement a health and safety policy with a minimum requiring uh, the face mask and uh, that they would have to do it to uh, reduce the transmission and that there is a fine located with that. Uh, so what we've done, and, and, and I know the city's doing this too, but we've ordered a million masks that we'll have available here in the next week or so. And we'll be giving, uh, there's 50 per box, we'll be giving two boxes. Uh, we've identified some 10,000 small businesses that do business. Uh, with the public, uh, whether it's dry cleaners, hair salons, uh, restaurants, etc., and so we'll be starting on June the 4th, 24th at the Coliseum uh, from 7:30 to 2:30, offering them. And then we'll also do it at Bibliotech uh, Saturday, June the 27th, from 9:30 uh, to 2:30. And you just need to call the registry. We'll have it on our website. We'll get the information out to you. But we know there are a lot of small businesses that need. Uh, some additional help and now that we're asking them to require their customers as well as their employees to wear the mask uh, that's important let me just give you one story why this works uh, this story came out of uh, uh, out of missouri 
uh, it was a hairstylist called Great Clips. Uh, one of their uh, 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 workers there uh, had uh, tested po uh, positive for, uh, for COVID, and that person had ident identified 84 customers that she was exposed to. Another one also tested positive, and she was exposed to 56 uh, patients. So they tracked them all down. No new positive cases. Why? Because the salon required the customer to wear the face mask and required their uh, technicians to wear their face masks. So in that particular instance, it could have been a real uh, spread, and it wasn't because everybody was taking the uh, precaution to do that. So, you know, we say it over and over, but uh, try to stay six feet apart. If you can't, put the face mask on and sanitize and make everything go right and we'll be okay. But we're not doing that, and uh, we've got to start doing it. Too many people are going around without the face mask, and it's putting in danger people that have uh, uh, a uh, uh, underlying health issue. Uh, I, I like the mask that the uh, uh, mayor has today. It says respect. Respect for people that you're around, because you could transmit it to somebody that's vulnerable, and that person could end in the hospital, and that person could die. You owe a responsibility not to do that. Great. Thank you, Judge. And I also want to thank uh, Alejandra Herrera, uh, young woman who's uh, young lady who is making uh, these masks and donating the, pro donating the proceeds to her school district. Uh, I also want to mention that we are uh, fairly dramatically spinning up capacity in terms of tracing as well as testing. And uh, Dawn is here to talk a little bit more about that if you have questions. But we have almost 7,000 capacity now in terms of testing, and folks are, are lining up to get them. And we want to make sure that those who need tests get tests. I want to make mention of one thing. Um, if you have been, if you have had COVID-19 and you're you're recovered, we want to encourage you and con that you consider a plasma donation. Uh, a friend of many of ours, uh, Lawrence Scott, uh, was in the hospital and not doing very well at all. Uh, received a plasma donation and now is, has recovered. And I'm uh, glad to know uh, that he is and, and hope you're doing much better, uh, Lawrence. Uh, but I want to make a mention of this. Um, if you need to or if you would like to um, offer a plasma donation, if you're recovered, you can call 210-731-2719 or you can email COVID-19 at SouthTexasBlood.org. Also, if you're interested in joining the city's COVID-19 response team, Metro Health Health is hiring for more than 70 temporary positions. You can visit sanantonio.gov slash HR to view those opportunities. And finally, again, you can get updates on COVID-19 at any time. The latest information by going to the website covid19.sanantonio.gov or you can text COSAGOV to 55000. Again, uh, we are watching the data points. We remind, remind you, do everything you can, help us slow the spread so we can continue uh, to get back to um, the activities that we enjoy, but we've got to do this together. We've got to work together to do it. Uh, wear the face mask, maintain physical distance, sanitize uh, hard surfaces, wash your hands, and we will be watching the data, especially in the hospitals. We have Eric Epley here to talk about that as well, Dr. Emmerich, and myself and the judge, and we'll take questions now. All right, we'll continue to follow this news conference live on KSAT.com on the live stream. But another dramatic rise today in the number of cases, 408 new cases. That brings the total to 5,550 and two new deaths to report. So we are now at 92 deaths in Bear County. And 267 people hospitalized. That number one that they are watching closely. Uh, many have said that that is an indication of the severity of the spread. That number is up from Tuesday as well. There was an important message to small businesses in that from Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf after the executive order uh, now requiring businesses to mandate their customers and patrons wear masks. The city and the county have ordered a million masks and they'll be distributing those to about 10,000 small businesses. A couple of dates for that distribution upcoming. The city says that it will have that put on its website and get that information out there. Yeah, an indication both the county judge and the mayor saying they're ramping up efforts. They're hiring more people for Metro Health, uh, ordering one million masks for small businesses. The mayor saying these are trends we should be concerned about and the capacity at the hospitals is stable, but the trends are disturbing. Greg, we'll have sports up next. The NBA has announced it's laid off at least 100 employees and that the cuts are 
unrelated to the COVID-19 pandemic. NBA spokesman Mike Bass says we are restructuring certain functions in the league office to better align with changes in our business, particularly around digital media, and be well positioned for future growth. This all comes before the NBA restarts its season July 31st at the Wide World of Sports Complex at Disney World. The impacted employees will be paid through July 6th. Dallas Mavericks owner Mark Cuban says he will kneel with his players during the national anthem if they choose to do so when the NBA resumes its season next month. That is what Cuban told ESPN. Despite the fact league rules say players and coaches must stand for the national anthem, players are expected to let their feelings be known in the wake of the death of George Floyd while in police custody. And Cuban says he will be right there with them if they choose to do so. To dig in. The Brennan Bears are back at work, wrapping up their second week of strength and conditioning workouts in the wake of the OIL's restart guidelines. Bears football went 7-2 and two in district last year, finished 9-3. and three. That included a 35-13 victory over Roosevelt in the playoffs before losing to Austin Westlake in the next round, 24-6. Even through all this, the team's going to come together, and um, we're going to be running for state, running for district champs, and I really don't see anyone else in our way. Right now we're just staying the course and doing what we got to do and handling our business and kids are to handle it very businesslike, you know, doing a great job and I think they're excited again to be back and, and, and just being as normal as possible, you know, which I think is critical and, and so it's really good and I know the coaches are happy, the kids are happy and, and so we all got smiles. The Brennan Bears will kick off their 2020 season when they visit the Reagan Rattlers on Saturday, August the 29th at 7 p.m. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Former Houston Texans Kareem Jackson has tested positive for the coronavirus. The now Bronco safety told The Athletic he started feeling congested with chills on Monday, so he decided to get tested and the test came back positive. He says the symptoms are mild at this time and he will self-isolate for the next two weeks. Jackson says more than likely he picked up the virus while traveling last week. Jackson now becomes the second Bronco to test positive for the coronavirus. The first was Von Miller, who after two weeks of self isolation test came back negative frustrated due to a lack of negotiation regarding the new long-term contract today jet star safety jamal adams announced he wants to be traded adams still has two seasons left on his original rookie contract since signing with new york in 2017 the jets are looking to play out his contract which is a bargain right now at three and a half million dollars this season almost 10 million next year adams would like to become the highest paid safety at over 14 and a half million a season which is what the bears are paying eddie jackson the jets say they have no intention of trading adams major league baseball's players association is now proposing a 70 game season to the team owners it's after owners thought they had a deal on a 60 game season following a four-hour negotiating session on tuesday in phoenix the commissioner rob manfred believing a 60 game season is too short under the new union plan, the season would begin on July 19th, run through September 30th. It would include a universal designated hitter and a 50-50 split on new TV revenue in 2021. It would also include $50 million in playoff bonuses. So the good news is there is progress. The better news is they're now closer. Yeah. So hopefully we'll get this done by the maybe next week. Yeah. <laughs> We're 10 games away. We'll see. That's yeah. great. Sure. We'll be right back. It's our KSAT Q&A where we take your questions, our questions to some of the experts and get facts on exactly what is going on. And uh, every Thursday we are joined by Dr. Ruth Bergeron from the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio. Doctor, I'm, I'm really glad we have you today because it seems timely. You know, we talked to the president of UT Health San Antonio on Monday, Dr. Henrich, who, who si sounded an urgent alarm about what he is seeing. And I know that you have been in emergency rooms. You've seen patients there. Tell me what you're seeing in the ERs these days. So I'm not an ER doc, but I am an infectious disease specialist, Steve, and I have been in the hospital last week and this week, and I'm rounding on all of the inpatient infectious disease folks and speaking with my colleagues. And we are seeing days where we'll have you know 12 new patients show up in the intensive care unit with COVID-19. And that is an extraordinary increase from what we had been seeing um, just two weeks ago. And what we notice is several things. People are really sick. On average, they seem to be younger. It's a younger crowd than we were seeing earlier on. And we're seeing really young people be really sick in the ICU. And we're very worried about this.
You talk about people being young. We've heard people under 30. Uh, can you give a little bit of an idea what the age range really is and also the symptoms specifically? Because I hear a lot of people say, well, it's like the flu, is it? Or it's a, it's a respiratory illness. Uh, we've, some of us have had that before or something similar. But talk about the ages and, and the actual physical symptoms you're seeing. Right. So we, we are seeing people in our hospital that are in their late teens and early 20s. And they are not being spared from the very, very serious disease progression and outcomes. We are seeing people that young going to the intensive care unit and needing advanced life support. So, but as far as the symptoms, it does start out kind of like a flu-like illness and it's fever and body aches and cough, maybe some sore throat. Y'all have heard about uh, maybe the loss of the sense of taste or smell. That's not 100% across the board, but that's one of the symptoms. And in the first week, it might just putter along like that. Although I'm hearing that the body aches that people get during that first week can be pretty severe. When the fever hits, your body really, really hurts. But then what happens um, in the second week for the folks that are progressing, the ones that are going to wind up getting hospitalized, they start to not be able to breathe. They can't breathe. And they also complain of pain in their chest. And these are the things that ultimately drive them to come into the emergency room. And there we try to get to them as fast as we can and put them on oxygen, initiate treatments. Um, we do have some treatments. But honestly, as we look at these surging numbers for hospitalizations, we're really worried about running out of remdesivir. We're worried about running out of our medication supply. Are you worried about running out of room? So um, right now we're good. Uh, we have beds, but we look at projected curves and we have modeling available to us that helps us figure out based on how steeply the curve is rising for hospitalizations now. We look at where we are today and predict where we're going to be two weeks from now. We can see that we're going we're gonna to need more beds. So we're looking around our own hospital and identifying, you know, our old tower. Our, there's, there's rooms um, there that um, aren't being used maximally. There is a rehabilitation facility where we could move people out and turn that into a place where we take care of COVID patients. So that's where we're at today. We're, and we're, we're making backup plans for coverage of teams and what are we going to do if we don't have um, enough medical doctors available? How, how do we um, rearrange our schedules and our teams so that every patient has coverage? Let's talk about ways we can prevent getting to that point. We have said it a, a thousand times. We hear it from medical professionals like you, our local leaders, about face masks. Wear a mask. What evidence is there that proves that face masks really do work? So um, earlier on this segment, we heard Judge Wolf talk about an anecdote from uh, Missouri where um, people were cutting hair and they had symptoms and they were sick, but nobody got infected by them. And that was only because um, those people were wearing masks and their clients were wearing masks. So that's an anecdote. But there are several uh, peer review articles that have come out in very respected scientific journals just in the last couple of weeks that look at data from around the world and from the United States. And we are able to estimate through their analysis the number of cases that have been averted simply by masking. So for instance, um, over just a, about a month or two, Italy was able to avert something like 78,000 cases and New York City was able to avert about 66,000 cases just from the implementation of masking. Wuhan, China has similar data. And in another article, we looked specifically at U.S. data and amongst 15 states where there was government mandated facial covering, it is possible to determine that within 21 days of that, that kind of masking order going into effect, 21 days later, you start to see daily a 2% drop in the incidence of new cases. And so 2% might sound tiny, but cumulatively over time and spread across a large population, you are talking about not tens of thousands, but hundreds of thousands of cases averted. And it is estimated for our country, for those 15 states plus Washington, D.C., that we have averted about a quarter of a million to maybe up to over 400,000 cases of COVID-19 
just from masking alone. So that is powerful. Yeah. Those are powerful numbers. And it's such a simple thing to do to put a mask on. I mean, it takes me right a few seconds. I do this. I'm inconvenienced for about a second as I put it on. Um, but that small act and wearing that mask consistently is my part to help contribute to this important effort to fight the virus and save many lives. Masking saves lives. I want to quickly get to a graph that you uh, were kind enough to share with us and we can kind of talk about what we're seeing uh, in some of the modeling here. Tell us what we're looking at right now, Dr. Bergren. Is provided to us by a company that does health system analytics. It's called SG2. What they do is take real data from our community. This isn't just estimated based on other communities. This is looking at San Antonio, when we've taken our social distancing measures, what we're doing now, what kind of cases we're seeing. And it's projecting for us uh, what's going to happen in the weeks and the months that are coming. And you see there, I'm, I'm not able to see it, but I know what I'm describing. But what you see is two different curves. And one of them is gray, and it's going way up. And it's peaking in about mid-August, and it's showing you COVID-19 hospitalizations. So over there on the y-axis, you're looking at number of cases of people in the hospital. Your x-axis is your time. And you can see that you know if you look at where we are now in June at about 271 cases, that in a couple of weeks, we're going to double. And if we keep on that trajectory, which means don't change anything, San Antonio, keep doing what you're doing, we're going to be up at 1,900 cases by mid-August. Here's the big problem. Our current bed capacity in San Antonio is 1,400. So that means after July 20th, we are going to exceed our current bed capacity. That's why we're looking around um, for extra beds and how are we going to plan for this surge. And I just want to clear. I want to. So I want to clarify for a second, Ruth. Is sorry. We're not talking about new cases. We're talking about new cases of people being hospitalized when we talk about that 1900 number. And we don't have enough beds for that people, many people right now. These are these would be hospitalized cases. And right now we have 1400 and we would need 1900. Um, so it's not that we won't be able to expand. I believe that we can. There's there are backup plans that are being looked at across the city and we have an excellent excellent emergency response group that is taking these numbers seriously and planning. But boy, we don't need to go there because look at the red curve. That is a flattened curve. And you know how we get to that curve? It doesn't involve sheltering in place. It doesn't mean we have to revert to the total shutdown that we had before. All we have to do to get to that red curve, which is a much better scenario and where we want to be, is wear the mask, social distance, and stay away from indoor activities where you have lots of people crowded together. I'm talking bars, gyms, parties. Those are the things that we're hearing about that people have been doing when they come in sick. And that's the sort of stuff that we must ask people to stop doing. And I worry a lot about Father's Day coming up because I know everybody wants to go see their dad and pay their respects and we love our families and we want to make exceptions because we feel like family is family so of course we can be together but when you talk to the folks who are coming into our emergency room about how did you get this virus it isn't necessarily that they went to a wild party some of them did but not necessarily some of them just went to a family gathering where extended family came in you had more people together in an indoor space than should be and folks that have had exposures elsewhere they're asymptomatic but they're infected and now they're transmitting it to one another so that's what we have to do wear the mask social distance wash the hands we can stop the spread we really can and we can go for that red curve and we don't have to look at that gray curve, but everybody has to get on board. Everybody has to do their part. A lot more questions, including what we're going to do about school coming up here in less than two months. And we're going to continue this conversation tonight on the night beat at 10. Dr. Ruth Bergeron from UT Health San Antonio. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. We'll be right back.
One retail organization expecting Father's Day this year to be a big one for retailers. The National Retail Federation expects consumers to spend $17 billion on Father's Day this year. The report says that 77% of the shoppers they surveyed say Father's Day is especially important because we're in a pandemic and they want to give a gift that matters. So what kind of gift is that? 41% of shoppers told the NRF that this year's gift had to be unique or different. 36% said they wanted to create a special memory. It looks like shoppers are willing to spend more for that to happen, too. The NRF says that each consumer will spend around $149 on Father's Day gifts. How about a Father's Day forecast? There you go. How about nice a 20 weather would be a gift? Yeah, well, a 20% chance of rain is right. what's in the forecast. But hey, 20% is better than 0%. Let's look at it that way, right? 92 right now will be 83 degrees by 10 p.m. Midnight 78, waking up to a temperature in the mid 70s tomorrow morning. We'll be back to talk about those rain chances and a whole lot more coming up. Feels like you could just ring out the air out there, but muggy. Yeah. And in some cases, we have rung out the air. That's the nice thing. Some we, cases, yeah, right? Some isolated cases. But at the airport today, about a quarter of an inch of rain earlier this morning, we had a few little downpours flare up over San Antonio. You, isolated in nature, but at least they're, they're very efficient and good rain producers. Del Rio topped out at 95, 93 here in San Antonio. And New Braunfels, your high was 95. All right, the new drought monitor is in. But I want to point out, this is last week. So I'm starting with that. So we have a baseline, something to compare to. Now let's advance into today's newest drought monitor. And you notice that yellow area expanded quite a bit. Well, I should say a little bit. It expanded a little bit and it's going to continue to do that as well, judging by our weather pattern and what we're foreseeing here in the future in terms of rain chances. These little isolated pop ups aren't enough to really wipe away drought. However, where we need rain really the most across South Texas down near Eagle Pass to Carrizo Springs. That's where we got a good soaker last night and this morning. Talia and Eagle Pass, our weather watcher, measured two inches, and then you get down there a little closer to Carrizo Springs and just west of town there, 3.3 inches estimated by the radar. And west of San Antonio, right along Highway 90 last night at 10 and 11 p.m., we had an outflow boundary. That dropped an inch of rain estimated by the radar right along that Highway 90 corridor into Uvalde County and Kinney County. All right, so now we have some activity far to the south of us and even a little bit in Mexico. That activity coming off the mountains of Mexico should continue to dissipate as we go forward through this evening. But we're watching development up near San Angelo. There's a slight chance if that organizes, it could drop southward and then a few leftover showers could make it to the hill country later tonight. Something you just need to cross your fingers for. It's uh, doubtful but possible, okay? Possible, not probable. I like to put it that way. Upper level high, it's not parked directly overhead, which is good because that keeps that door open and the gateways open for any little disturbances and little opportunities to get these little showers and pop up downpours. And they're isolated, 20% coverage, but They've been efficient. Some of them have dropped an inch or more of rainfall, so there is that slight potential. It's just not the greatest chance. Better than zero, though. Okay, 20% is better than 0%. Tomorrow, same chances. 74 in the morning, 93 in the afternoon, a southeasterly breeze at 5 to 15. Then it's same old through the upcoming weekend. Saturday, by the way, summer solstice at 4.43 p.m. Astronomical summer begins and we get into Sunday on your father's day will be 70s in the morning, 90s in the afternoon with that 20% chance. So yeah, we have that isolated chance every day, but don't go canceling any outdoor plans. It's brief and uh, high and really localized. And next week we are expecting that African dust to make it here by about Tuesday, Wednesday time frame. So that's something to definitely keep in mind. All right. <laughs> oh, oh wow. how did you keep that a secret this whole ah, time? It was very hard to. I was so tempted to be running around the newsroom showing these bad boys. <laughs> huh? Wow. What do you think of that? Huh? It's nice. It I'm is? smiling underneath it. That's why I <laughs> put my thumbs up when I'm taking <laughs> pictures of people with these. Yeah. Right? We got a few of these Therm Thurs masks, so uh, thermometer winners. You'll be getting them. If you run into, me, run into me at HEB or Costco, I'll have a few extra ones in my back pocket, okay? Um, otherwise, I'll try to find another way to give them away. But <laughs> I, I like it better as a, as a 
as a mask than a pocket scarf. <laughs> it was a good pocket square, but it does make a better mask. Uh, there it's, we go. It's a so, good look all in all. I am doing my part right now. Yeah, you are. And Jen, Jen Herrera, Jen Herrera with the birthday on Sunday. You are this week's homemade thermometer winner. And, and she gets a mask. I'll give you a few masks for the whole household. Nice. Love yeah, I'll it. I'll give you a few masks. So happy early birthday to you. Good timing, huh? All right, the enthusiasm under the mask. I'm smiling, yeah, I swear. Yeah, you can tell. <laughs> we'll be right back. A brand new show launched today called KSAT Explains. It's a new weekly show dedicated to taking one topic that's making news and giving you perspective and context to all the headlines. The premiere episode of KSAT Explains is focused on the unrest in America that we're seeing right now, from racism to police reform to protest culture. We explore all of those issues and more with personal stories and what they mean specifically for us here in San Antonio. You can catch KSAT Explains by streaming, either watching it online at KSAT.com or through the KSAT TV streaming app. And it's on demand, so you can watch anytime you want. The first episode is up now. We'll be right back.